Welcome into the Zephon Wasteland Survival Course Builders. Today, by request, we're going to take a look at the different factions available in the 1.0 release. Like technologies, the different factions are split into three categories. We have Cyber Affinity, we have Human Affinity, and we have Voice Affinity. And what this will do is decide on your starting units, as well as which techs you get early. Every faction has access to every other faction's techs. The only things that are unique are each individual faction has a few techs that are unique to him. For example, the Emulated Mind has special techs that affect her data hacking or her uh, Oblivion Cannon, and everyone will have something like that. Beyond that, your individual faction leader will decide on a set of traits that will influence how you would like to play them optimally or just give you a little different flavor between them. Let's go ahead and take a look at each one of these factions. I think I'm going to divide this up by affinity and we're going to start with the human affinity, our classic fallen soldier. Human affinity, as mentioned, gives us our starting units. Let's just go through each one of these different ones and see what he's all about. Human affinity, a war with aliens, monsters, and machines knows no borders. This soldier is sworn to protect all human life against extinction. Start with militants and gain early access to human technologies. I'm not gonna go through this on each one. Uh, I'll just point out what the affinity is. For his individual traits, we have Undying. The fallen soldier's followers carries a piece of his flesh around and share in his uncanny healing power. Units regenerate hit points each turn. This is a very powerful ability. Normally, in order to heal, you have to have a unit sit still and not fire or move on their turn. You can gain some bonuses depending on the type of tile you're in. For example, an outpost or in a city tile will increase the amount that you heal. Beyond that, healing is relatively rare. There's a few hero abilities that are pretty good but often come with long cooldowns, and a couple units have some healing abilities. Again, oftentimes either long cooldowns or it takes their actions to do that. Being able to essentially have regeneration is very powerful. Let's say you walk up and take an overwatch that you weren't expecting. Well, you could get a little healing beyond that. Or even if you're sitting back and you're safe after a firefight, being able to heal that extra HP just for free each turn will get your unit back up and running much quicker. Or perhaps you can heal up partially and then as you're moving back to the front, you'll finish healing up the rest of the way. This works no matter what. So if you are, for example, inside of a carrier unit or whatever else, they get their healing each turn. The Fallen Soldier has a military background. Decades of training have taught the Fallen Soldier to secure transport as fast as possible. Start with an Outrider instead of a third squad of militants. This is a really nice bonus and it combos very well with his Undying. The Outrider is an early, I'm going to call it a scout transport. It can only fit a single unit. However, combining that with Undying means that if at the end of your turn, you have a unit that is very low and maybe it's there's just no way you can move him and keep him safe, you can just hop in the Outrider and you can happily heal and regenerate inside there from safety. In order to kill your unit, they would have to kill the Outrider first. Very nice. In addition, the Outrider is much less likely to move forward into the fog and eat some horrific Overwatch fire that leaves you so wounded that on the enemy turn they can finish you off. So it's often nice to have the Outrider take point. You can clear other things Overwatch or just ensure that your other units that move up to back it up are not triggering their own enemies. Very, very good bonus there. Although. I think if you're just starting out, it might feel a little weak because the damage is so-so, having only one heavy machine gun on it. It's actually a pretty good bonus. Leave no man behind. Bling bringing every soldier home comes with a high price. Unit upkeep of the fallen soldier's army is increased. This is kind of a whatever. Um, I don't feel this is too bad, especially considering undying and our training that we can do. We are gonna wanna build ourselves a pretty elite force of units. And this isn't too bad. You're going to have unit upkeep anyway, so making an extra farm or an extra mine isn't too bad. 
Finally, we have Survival Training Elite. In a crisis, only the best soldiers make it out alive. Spend influence to increase the experience of a unit. This is really good. Uh, as units go up in experience, they get extra HP, extra damage, extra morale. Very handy to get. Um, yeah, can't, can't really go wrong with that much. Okay, next we're going to look at the next human faction. That is the Honorable Aristocrat. Again, he has human affinity, so he starts with the three militants. The Honorable Aristocrat is honor-bound. The Honorable Aristocrat's talents ensure the best deals for all. Trade agreements and alliances generate extra influence for both parties. So, unlike the soldier who is really, really good at fighting, our specialty lies in diplomacy. So if you set up a map with a lot of different factions, perhaps you could make allies and trade partners with several of them, and both you and your trade partners will benefit from that. If you're playing co-op, maybe that is something of interest to you there too. Remember, both parties benefit from this. Hired Hands. Hard work is not one of the aristocrats' personal virtues, preferring to buy in help. Spend influence to rush production. This is really good. I don't know of a lot of ways other than this in Zephon to be able to rush production, but that is very, very strong. One turn sooner is one turn stronger for a lot of things. So getting extra resources, getting extra production started, getting your construction building sooner. Very, very strong here. And I think that combos well with his additional influence that he can get from the good trade deals. Gluttony. To the aristocrat and his people, a refined palate is a basic survival need. Population food upkeep is increased. I don't find that one to be too bad. Again, just like with the soldiers, unit upkeep, that's a couple extra farms. It's kind of a whatever. Not bad. Quid pro quo. The world's densest system of butter rests at the aristocrat's fingertips. Spin spend influence to purchase vital resources. I believe this means that he just gets better deals as everyone is able to use the market. Overall, I think this guy's pretty decent. Uh, a little less uh, focused necessarily on the straight fighting. Maybe a little more eco economy uh, focused here. For our third human faction, we have the Practical Romantic. He has human affinity, so he starts with the three militant units. He has Scavenger. The Romantic survived the apocalypse on the streets, salvaging everything he could to stay alive. Units generate resources by defeating enemies. This is really good. Um, this is actually a very aggressive trait. You want to be out there and clearing out units. I believe the higher tech and the higher level the unit is, the more resources you get from this. That makes getting out there early and fighting often very powerful. Don't sleep on that bonus there. Also, that does mean if you have allies helping you, you want to make sure you are getting the killing blows. I'm not... I don't think he gets the resources if somebody else gets the killing blow. Uh, correct me in the comments if I'm incorrect on that. There is hope. His tongue was as silver as his beard. Spent influence to restore a unit's morale. Uh, a pretty nice ability. Uh, it is very detrimental to be shaken or have um, broken morale. Being able to restore that just here is pretty nice. However, that's going to have to be done because heartfelt, heartfelt loss. Romantics people had more hope to lose when disaster struck. Morale losses are increased. So make sure you have a little stockpile of influence so that you can heal that up. There's nothing worse than losing a big battle because you have kind of a cascade of morale drop that causes you to lose a unit, which makes other people lose morale, which makes you lose a unit, and so on. Reallocate Elite. Once a kind soul gave the Romantic a second chance, now he does the same for his people. Reallocate units to regain resources and speed up production. Again, that very rare speed up. I believe for this one, you take the unit to one of your cities and you are able to essentially reintegrate them back into the city and get these bonuses. Pretty decent. Next up, let's go ahead and take a look at the Cyber Affinity. First up is the Emulated Mind. If you haven't already, I did a slow play tutorialized playthrough that just finished as the Emulated Mind. I'd strongly suggest checking that out if you're interested in the game, and you can kind of get a feel for how a match will go. She has Cyber Affinity, and Cyber Affinity starts with Isham Enforcers, a pretty decent unit. Um, they can self-heal, they have some plus accuracy techs and some armor techs. Pretty pretty solid starter unit. 
She has a resource network. The emulated mine is master of logistics and supply management, gain additional resources from outposts. Outposts are point of interest on the map that you capture. And this kind of makes up for her trapped trait, but I'm not sure if it fully does. We'll, we'll talk about that again on trapped. Fortress armament. Oblivion awaits anyone foolish enough to attack the emulated mine directly. Her city possesses a long range defensive cannon. As seen in my let's play, this is a really good weapon, and in the early game it is very, very helpful, both on the defensive and to help you clear out the surrounding area. However, it seems like the range maxes out at, let's call it maybe 12 tiles. That sounds pretty big, but even on just a four player map, that isn't even a quarter of the map. Especially if you only build one city, which you can only do here, in the corner of the map, the cannon's not going to be able to reach out and do much for you. So I feel like it kind of incentivizes you to try to push towards the middle of the map to drop your city, which can be relatively dangerous. So be warned there. With upgrades, though, this cannon is pretty dang damaging. I, I was pretty happy with it. Trapped. The emulated mind is locked inside a single structure, so her people built a citadel around her. She is limited to her starting city and can build no more. So every other faction can build more than one city with an engineer unit. She cannot. You get one city. Data Hack Elite. The emulated mind is connected with the entirety of human knowledge. On an enemy database is child's play to her. Spend influence to temporarily duplicate research output from the other player's city. Pretty nice if you can find a city early enough. You can get a nice little boost trading some influence for research. That's a pretty good trade. And I know that later on she has a tech that will give her um, some resources too. You can duplicate like a percentage of the other city's resources. Next up we have the Heartless Artificer. She is again Cyber Fandy, has the Isham Enforcers. Engineered Life, the Artificer has no fear of apparent science and it helps the expansion of her people. Population growth rate is increased. Population growth is one of the limiting factors to how big your city can get. And it's it's a soft cap in theory, but in practice, it's kind of a hard cap. You don't want to be very high, very far above your population cap. Things will just become increasingly inefficient as you do that. So this is a pretty good bonus. However, Fountains of Blood. Low productivity invokes the Artificer's ire. Sacrifice population to increase production. So... You can wipe out a pop to make yourself build faster. This is a good bonus. Again, that's a rare thing to be able to do, but be careful. You don't want to lose too much pop. You're falling behind as you lose pop, essentially. Immoral. The bright burning vision of the future espoused by the Artificer is inhumanly demanding. To keep her population's ever decreasing loyalty up, it must be reset using influence. I believe this is you lose one loyalty every turn until you use that ability on a city on the city so it can be a little bit pricey to keep that up so you're going to need a pretty steady influx of influence artificer's precision she sees what others do not beyond good and evil spend influence to temporarily increase the accuracy of all units accuracy can be read as damage they kind of sort of mean the same thing in this game um that's kind of a oversimplification, but you can imagine it as such. So you can spend influence to deal more damage. Pretty good little bonus. Next up, we have the Rogue Operative. Cyber Fanny again. We start with the Isham Enforcers. She has Hit and Run. Quick-witted operatives refuse to be bound by conventional tactics. Units may move after taking an action. This is very powerful. Normally, you get one action and a move. If you move first, you can take your action. If you take your action first, it also uses up your movement. You can set yourself up to have ambushes where the enemy moves up, you overwatch them, maybe they fire back, maybe they're out of range. Your turn starts, you fire at them a second time, and then you move away. That is a very powerful combination to be able to do. Or let's say you need to move a hero to safety. Well, you can attack first and then get out to safety. This is very powerful. Very, very powerful. And it makes her units play a lot differently than maybe others would. 
augments. The rogue operative was born a skilled hacker, but her augments turned her into a savant. Spend influence to augment a single attribute on a non-large unit. We can upgrade um, like damage or accuracy. I don't remember what the exact ones were, but it's pretty good. It does cost influence. And I do think you'd like to get this out onto all of your units. Um, I, I think you can only do one per turn, I want to say. So you definitely want to be doing that and getting everyone boosted up the best you can. It also means that relative between non-large units and your infantry units, the infantry units are a little better than they would be for other cyber units because she can buff them with the augments. Independent. A crew of three thinkers and radicals follow the operative into battle, but they all are looking out for number one. Population has increased loyalty upkeep. So you're going to need some extra loyalty buildings, essentially. Um, not the best, because a loyalty building also needs a population to work it. And that population also has increased loyalty upkeep. So this is one of the more harsh um, penalties, I feel. But it's nothing you can't overcome. Icarus Satellite. The greatest secret weapon ever produced by Icar Corp is now in the sole control of the rogue operative. Spend influence to fire it at enemy units. Uh, just kind of like essentially a spell that you can cast with influence to damage things. Pretty good. Next up, we have the voice factions. And unfortunately, we only have two right now. I'm hoping we're going to get a third free one so everyone has three. Uh, I didn't actually realize that right away that there were only two here. I kept thinking I was forgetting somebody. First up, we have the Furtive Tribunal. Voice Affinity. We start with Abkluth Dragoons and Early Access to the Voice Text. I like the Dragoons, but I feel like they're much squishier than our other affinities. They're also melee, which means you can't shoot flying units. That can be a bit of a problem. Good mobility is nice. But be careful, they are really fragile. They are really fragile. They also only have three models. So if you lose one model, you've lost a third of your damage. Whereas militants have, I believe, six or eight. So you're only losing a small portion if you were to lose one model. Dark Omen. Their connection with the voice allows them to see past what normal mortals see. Enemy units near the furtive tribunal cities are revealed even without regular sight range. So if something's hiding in the woods near your city and otherwise you wouldn't know it's there, you will know that there's a unit there. Whispers of the voice. The voice's murmurings inspire impossible wisdom and capture whispers of the future. Spend influence to accelerate research. And you're definitely going to want to do that because mysticism. The three believe that spiritual apprehension precedes intellect. Research laboratories have decreased output. So essentially, you need extra influence in order to catch up in research. The Outsider. As the tribunal gives themselves over to the voice, it graces them with an avatar of its love and its wrath. Spend influence to summon a terrifying voice unit from beyond the void. I believe this is a dream eater. I'm not sure if it's always a dream eater or if that changes. Uh, pretty decent unit overall. And it's nice to be able to summon something in uh, just on the fly wherever you need it. Okay bonus there. Our second voice faction is the untold, excuse me, the untold prophet. He is voice affinity. We start with the dragoons. We have cult expansion. The prophet's followers spread his word across the land. Benefit from a reduced loyalty penalty for each city. Normally, every time you build another city, every city, including the one you just built, has a loyalty penalty. I believe it is six. So your first city and your second city, when you build it, will each be at minus six loyalty. So if your first city had, let's say, six pop and was at zero, and then you build a second city, now you're at negative six loyalty, and your new city is also at negative six or whatever it's going to be. There's, that's not quite the right numbers, but the gist is you start at a penalty. So you'll have to build a loyalty building just to get them back to baseline. If I build a third city, then every one of those cities is going to need an additional loyalty building. So the first one's going to need one, the second one's going to need another, and my brand new city is going to need two loyalty buildings just to get it up to par. So you can see how that adds up very quickly, and it makes city spamming much less desirable. So we have a less penalty to that. That's pretty good. That I think that kind of translates to you want one more city than, than your opponents have. Words of the Prophet. 
All may be forgiven by the Prophet's touch. Spend influence to convert an enemy unit. And the more valuable the unit, the more it costs. Very powerful here. Very powerful. Let's say you could capture a medic unit that your enemy has. Not only are they now not healing their own units, now you could heal yours. Very good. I, I don't think this works on heroes. I could be wrong, but I would be shocked if it does. Cost of Conviction. The cult must never be allowed to waver. The Untold Prophet's population also has an influence upkeep. Not too bad, I would say. Um, it sure would be nice if we started with in a tile that gives us a bonus for influence, because we're going to need a little extra, because every one of our pops is going to need a little bit. So keep that in mind when you're planning out how you're going to spend your population uh, working in buildings. Armor of Faith. The Untold Prophet's will is so strong, it can reshape reality itself to protect his most loyal followers. Make a unit temporarily invulnerable. Very powerful. Uh, you can lure things in trying to finish a unit off and then make them invulnerable. Uh, you accidentally move up into an ambush and you barely survive it. Make them invulnerable. Good, good ability and gives him something that's a little combat uh, usable, which he otherwise doesn't really have. I do feel that the two voice ones are maybe a little weaker than the others. Um, our next playthrough is going to be with one of the two voice factions. So we'll have to check it out and see what we can do to bring them up to par. All right. Thank you for joining me in the Zephron Wasteland survival course. I hope this was relatively helpful. Just an overview of the different factions. Go ahead and post below which faction is your favorite and which that you think maybe is the weakest faction right now. And let's see what people are feeling. All right, I will see you in the Wasteland Builders. Get out there and build an outpost.